Okay, uh, hello everybody. Um, good morning. Um, very happy that you all made it here. And before we begin, I'll just do a few organizational remarks, um, maybe repeating, um, but for everybody who's new, so they also know. First of all, please really be careful with the chairs, um, um, because, yeah, the tables, the desks, yeah, sorry. Um, I'm also tired. Um, please be, uh, be careful with the desks, the small tables. Um, put them up, then put the small uh, foot uh, beyond them, and then put them down. Don't play around with them. They're not super stable, uh, and they will fall off if you play around with them too much, and the people from the house here don't like that. <laughs> um, then also, maybe just to repeat it, um, outside, if you're smoking, please don't throw your cigarettes to the ground. There is a kindergarten outside, and the kids should not uh, play with your cigarettes. Um, use the ashtrays. They are right at the door, use them. Um, and I think that's it. Maybe also for everybody who's new, toilets um, are here on the same floor on the left, and if those are full, upstairs, um, just go up the stairs and there are some more toilets uh, also for you to use. Um, yeah, and then Hazi. Uh, good morning. It's great to see you here. And, um, I will introduce you um, just for short the organization. The, uh, the Platypus Affiliated Society, established in December 2006, organizes reading groups, public forum research, and journalism focused on the problems and tasks inherited from the old, new, and post political left for the possibilities of emancipatory politics today. Um, our reading groups in Berlin are on Wednesday uh, here at the Hedwig Dom House at 6 and 7 p.m. Um, there's also an English reading group if anyone want to join. It, it would be great. The next, um, the next lectures are about history and class consciousness and Marxism and philosophy from Lukács and Kosh. Um, yeah. Let me introduce the panel. Building a Marxist mass party anew. Lenin could look back on a half a century of experience of Marxist mass parties. First and foremost, the SPD. The Marxist mass party was thus a condition for the possibility of his revolutionary politics. Numerous projects from the millennial left have set themselves the goal to rebuild something similar in order to make revolutionary politics possible again. This task raises questions that go all the way back to Marx's dispute with the anarchists in the First International. What would it mean for the left to take political action today? What is the point of a political party for the left? Where do we stand with respect to the task of building this political party today. What is the meaning of the political party uh, for Marxism? Can Marxism help clarify this task? Um, the speakers are Johannes Rigel from Socialisterna Welfahrtspartiet in Sweden, Jakob Hunspichler from Junge Linke in Austria, uh, Marcel from Rad in the Netherlands, and Jim Igor Kalmenberg. Uh, from the campaign for a socialist party in Germany. <laughs> um, and I was ask Johannes to start. We, oui. one moment. <laughs> uh, every speaker got about 10 minutes, and then two to three minutes to answer to the panel, and then we open for the audience. Please, Johannes. Thank you very much. Is it on? Good. Nice to see you guys. Good morning. Also a bit of a run here. I'm not so well prepared for that, so <coughs> hopefully better prepared for this talk. Um, so the first question, uh, what would it mean for the left to take political action today? Uh, I find it kind of hard to answer because it kind of entails that there is a left that can take political action. Uh, and I have to claim that there can be no talk, really, of a left, in the sense that there once was, 
and hence also no talk really of political action in the sense that once was a question for the left that is no more. Um, for the left that once was, political action was very much about the struggle for socialism. Uh, and since there today is no struggle for socialism to talk about, not in any meaningful sense at least, political action I would say is rather some form of code language to forge oneself with chains to different camps of capitalist politics. Uh, so the second question, <clears throat> what is the point of a political party for the left? And it's the same problem here as with the previous question, but perhaps even a little worse. Um, I claim that there can be no political party in any meaningful sense. It's just not possible today, uh, at least not in a Swedish context, I would like to stress, which is really the only context I can claim to know much about. Um, <coughs> the reason for this, again, Swedish context, is simply, in my opinion, that there is no independent workers' movement to speak about. Uh, nor can we say to have too much what we could call socialist intellectuals to brag about either. We're not spoiled with those. Um, attempts at shortcutting this problem is what I myself has made, made uh, myself guilty of for some 20 years or so uh, before ending up here, you could say. Uh, and I dare to claim that any attempts to do this does more damage than help for long-term efforts. Um, if we, however, allow ourselves the, um, the pleasure of uh, dreaming for a few seconds that we are not where we are, then the point of a political party, in short, would be to advance the struggle for socialism, of course. Uh, this mainly by providing leadership, directions, and perspectives of possible goals, all to help raising levels of class consciousness. But dear friends and comrades, we are far, far away from that. Am I okay in time? Are you not, no, not keeping check? Good. <coughs> so th third question, where do we stand with respect to the task of building this political party today? And what I have said this far, in regards to previous questions should not in any way be understood as an attempt to sort of excuse copping out. That's not what I'm after. Um, actually, since we never even engaged in the struggle, we can't even surrender properly. And uh, rather I think that clarity of this situation is an uncompromising necessity for us to be able to even think about how to do any good at all in our lifetime. Um, I think we have to start from the premise that the struggle is over. And that the left died some hundred years ago. If we could agree upon that, we could start thinking about what questions relate to a reconstitution of a left and a retaking up of the struggle that was abandoned after its spectacular failure. <coughs> so the last question, what is the meaning of the political party for Marxism? Can Marxism help clarify this task? I would say that I am uh, very ma much in the camp, so to speak, for preparatory pre-political work. Um, there can be no party proper today. That, however, does not mean that there are no tasks for Mar Marxists, even if sometimes perhaps kind of obscure. A, a party could be and would have to be prepared, not at least in terms of education about the death of the left that once was and how that affects us. What do you mean? Nothing. Yeah, well, I, last paragraph. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting there. Um, last thing I like to say about this preparatory thing, so to speak, is I also believe that there is 
plenty preparatory work to be done in the working class in terms of working class independence. Uh, and even though I see that this, is, is in, this in no way requires Marxist education to be pursued, I believe, or I strongly claim, I would say, that this should task attention by Marxists worded as salt, so to speak. Thank you. It is quite easy to moderate this. <laughs> Please, Jacob. Hello. Yeah, thank, thank you for inviting me. Um, it's kind of special to me because I just talked to Jim um, before the panel that uh, one of my first uh, political, yeah, really conferences was the Platypus European Convention in 2014 or 15 in Frankfurt. Um, I just recently have joined a youth organization, the Young Greens back then, and some of the members have taken me to the Platypus Convention because they said, yeah, go there, there's r the real Marxism, that's there. And I went there and it was like all exciting, I was 16, so it was all exciting, uh, but I didn't understand anything, but I was, I, I was hooked. And that's also the reason why I said, okay, I'd like to come to the conference because for me, and for my organization now, Junge Linke Platypus has always been um, a very important organization in that sense that it served for us as a room for self-reflection, but also like this notion of the dead left is something that constituted my organization. Because we said, so just to give a brief, brief history, so we were the Young Greens um, and we were influenced by some sort of second international Marxism and with that, we were kicked out by the Green Party for that, for this influence. And after we asked ourselves, okay, if we're not a youth organization of a, of a Green Party anymore, which views we didn't even share, what, what is the task? Uh, what, what needs to be done? And one of our first thoughts always was, okay, the left, how it is today, it, it's, it's dead in a sense that it's a dead end. And how do we, s we solve that problem? So we saw two opportunities, either um, yeah, just give up and say, okay, it's done. And we, our, our own organization is a symptom of this. And our own organization shows that it's not possible to, to have this kind of um, revival of the left. Uh, and also, like you said, so you we don't see a party where it's possible to actually do Marxism. We don't have a workers' movement where it's possible to actually talk about Marxism, talk about Marxist questions, about critique. Um, so we just abandoned all and maybe do something like Platypus. Or we said, okay, isn't it possible to, to know all this, to have this in mind and consciously still try to do it, but with the consciousness of knowing that it's probably all just gonna fail. So that's also what we started with Junge Linke. We made an, 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 a means to an end because we said when we founded my organization, we said what, what our task is in the next 10 years is to, to found a political party or to form a political party for which the questions of the left and the questions of Marxism um, arise from the real development in the society. The questions of reform or revolution they're not questions that affect us today in a sense because society doesn't bring them up. We bring them up as something that the history of the left pushes us to, but it's not something that arises from the questions of how to achieve freedom today. So that's what I think is, uh, is, is probably the, the connection between Junge Linke and, and Platypus and also why I'm sitting here and why I find it interesting to not talk about too much about my organization and why it's the best because I'm not here to agitate any of you. That's not my interest. I'm here to have a, a nice discussion, a room for self-reflection and a room for exchange. Um, and that's also something, um, but that's, that's something that's changed in the last years, I'd said, because I had recently had an interview with uh, the Platypus. I think it's the review, but I think it's online in, in German. And one of the questions there was, was is the connection or what is the importance for, for Platypus plays for Junge Linke. And I think that changed something because I said we had this view that there was a dead left, but that you could still advance 
consciously and say, okay, isn't there something possible? Can we go to the next step where questions like reform or revolution get a real necessity again? Um, and Platypus has always been this room for reflection for us, this room for thought, this room where we can learn about Marxism and the tasks it, it plays. But through that it became closer, we became closer and closer, and I think today it's fair to say that it's probably um, not this room for self-reflection anymore, probably won't be in the future, because for that self-reflection you need to have a distance. And Platypus has always been like, has viewed Junge Linke as part of the dead left, and I think this is, this is not the point, the point anymore, because the, the connection became too close, and so we more and more have to we, we view it as, as I, I'd say, something hopeful, something that we hope that it's, it plays the, the right role and it turns the right direction. Um, but that's, that's not the point why I joined Platypus Reading Groups. I joined Platypus Reading Groups because I wanted to ask myself, is this all right what I'm doing here? But I, don't, I didn't want to justify what I'm doing. I, I, I wanted to have a place um, where I can where I can think about it and still have this other part of me that's actually doing political work without being political. So that's what, what, I, what I think is, is, is for me important and, and interesting today to discussing also with these other guests, is so how does this notion of a dead left and still doing political work, I, knowing that it's not possible to do political work at the moment, how does this change over time and, and what, what effect does it play? Um, I, I'd say to, on, on the last points that I find it most interesting to maybe see the similarities between our four approaches, I'd say here, but also the differences and bring them together in a view of what, what does it have to do with Platypus, which is creating its own history and its own um, yeah, footmarks in the left because for Junge Linke that's really true. And uh, I'm really happy if you have a lot of questions because I think what my organization represents and what it does, you can all probably read it up in English <laughs> in the next two months, but I'm here for having like a good discussion. So thanks if you do that. Uh, thank you for having us here. Um, normally someone else would have done the talk, but due to the price they couldn't make it, so I'm uh, doing the talk. Um, the first time we heard about Platypus was quite recently. Uh, some, one of the organizers mailed us. Uh, we weren't familiar with your groups before, so this is the first time interacting with you. Um, so I'm gonna just do my speech. Uh, the fall of the Soviet Union and the collapse of the communist world uh, in the 90s has resulted in a near total collapse of all communist organizations. Um, it wasn't until the two crisis of 2007 that a new generation of people uh, unburdened by the past has started to pick up our Marxist fight again against capitalism. Um, however, the traditions of all dead generation uh, weigh like a nightmare on the brains of the living and we ourselves, uh, Rod, and our upstart adult party, uh, the Socialista, uh, have experienced this three years ago uh, when we, the entire youth wing of the then Socialist Party of the Netherlands, were expelled for clinging to Marxism, uh, to the Marxist root that our former mother party once had. Um, it was once founded, our mother, former mother party, as a Maoist sect during the Sino Soviet split, uh, and against all odds, it did survive to be the only anti-capitalist uh, party still as a major political force. Uh, but like many such groups, it slowly loses, uh, lost their political radicalism over time and became more reformist. Um, in 2006, they had their most uh, members ever. Uh, and after that, every year and every election was just more losses and more losses. Uh, and they started moving further, further right to try to win back the electoral success they once had. Um, the adult cadre of the partner was firmly social democrat at this point uh, and deadly afraid of the worst communism, ironically given many of them founded the original party in the 70s. Um, and ironically even more because they still used Marx in imagery and in internal educational uh, documents. So, over time, a covert uh, faction originated within the youth, which tried to 
uh, made up mostly of millennials and uh, Gen Z, tried to reintroduce Marx into the party to turn the tide of this still somewhat relevant political force um, and push for plurality of opinion. Uh, but this just uh, escalated into more and more conflicts uh, over time with people making statements uh, and eventually it resulted in purges of members, purges of the most favored by the uh, people, uh, the candidates for the youth party. Um, and uh, we were all expelled, the entire youth wing except for maybe 12 people from the party at once. Um, so we started reflecting uh, and it started during the split of course. Um, but what is the problem with the left? Why hasn't it worked for more than 70 years in the West? Why did it fail in the Soviet Union? Um, and what we saw was a lack of willingness by many still existing parties to reflect on themselves. The Social Democrats aren't willing to reflect on their uh, politics and the small sects that continue to do the same thing uh, as the last 70 years uh, don't want to reflect on their own politics. Um, the Socialist Party that we were expelled from just kept saying it's not our time yet, even though they lost every election more and more. Um, and the small sex kept often clinging to minor rifts between Trotskyist party A and B about things that might not have been relevant in the Netherlands for decades. Um, so one of the core pillars because of this history for our organization uh, was founded by looking back at the history and the root of Marxism um, about how it formed and how it functioned. Uh, on what basis was a party a unified force? Um, and if we look before Lenin even at the SPD and its many counterparts like the Dutch one, uh, we found that they had ideologically, uh, ideological um, plurality and not ideological unity. Uh, and we think that this unity in action and uni uh, unity in action uh, and tactics, but diversity in opinion, the original definition of democratic centralism, um, was the driving force that prevented this, faction, uh, this fracturing and made them a, a strong political force. Um, so we removed the ban on factions internally uh, and our group now consists of anyone who calls himself anti-capitalist uh, and revolutionary. So our group consists of from anarchist to Maoist to Stalinist, um, but most of them are just calling themselves some form of Marxist with a tendency in one way or the other. Um, and we think this will prevent splits from happening in the future. Um, let's see. Um, so these decisions have uh, allowed us to unify a wide range of anti-capitalist views uh, from people who radicalized inside Extinction Rebellion and left it because it obviously didn't work uh, to people from the Green Party Youth Wing and many other people. Um, so. What should a party do? Um, and what should political action look like? So our party, our political action is many, uh, several things, but it's also mainly training cadres for the future. We need people trained to be political leaders in the future to build up more workers' power. Because the working, po uh, working class power doesn't just come ex into existence. Unions don't just exist. They need to be built by someone. Um, and if no one's doing it, it's gonna be us. Um, and so you train them in many different skills, uh, practical organizational skills, uh, education, uh, and we try to come up with new tactics uh, that fit our material, political and social conditions at home and in the world. Um, so in this way we bring together the anti-capitalist youth of the nation. Um, I'm gonna skip a bit because I'm... Let's see. Um, yeah, so. Uh, how can Marxism help us understand what a party is in the essence? Uh, the party is the political expression of the consciousness of the class itself. Um, it is the coordinating organ of the interest of the class aware of itself. Uh, it is the vanguard, of course, uh, but not a group that can will class conscious into being. It has to really exist. Uh, the unions, the working class, the SPD, and its contemporaries, what they had in the past were social clubs, um, and knitting society, socialist bars, uh, children nature camps, its own media, beyond just heavy political newspapers. Uh, and all those things held together to create 
a real class conscious organic niche to create a class that is not just a class in itself, but a class for itself. And from that, you can recruit people. Um, the most class conscious people in those circles will naturally see, we need to do something. I will go to the strongest or the party to help and bring their ideas and their experiences with them. Um, a comrade of us dove into the history and they saw that 90% of recruits uh, came from these social circles in the past, in the S uh, SDAP in the Netherlands, instead of people who just joined because they, they read books and thought Marx was right. Um, so a Marxist party is more than just a vanguard of the most class conscious worker. It is also the education of new cadre. It is also the bubble of the social media, uh, the book clubs, student groups, tenant unions, and all the other social clubs around it that aren't a core part of the party itself. Um, it is both the teacher and the student of the working class. It refines the ideas and it, uh, sorry, uh, it ran, refines the ideas of the masses and it is the creator of the masses as a group for itself. Uh, it's the plurality of the working class as well as its unity in action uh, and a break with our history of sectarian purity politics uh, and breaking uh, with intercurrent infighting breaking with being subject to geopolitical interests of the communist state of the old time, if necessary. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Thank you. My name is Jim Igor. Um, I'm from the um, Campaign for a Socialist Party that exists like in the United States, but also in Germany as Kampagne für eine Sozialistische Partei, CSP or KSP. Um, I, and, I, and I also happen to be a member of Kleidepus. I'm just like notioning this, especially now that like <laughs> everyone here, um, uh, yeah, you had kind of your, your Kleidepus coming out on this panel, but I have to say, I tried to really discipline myself not to talk Kleidepus here, but this, this uh, uh, commentary, I have to say that it's, it's not that easy to, to be in Kleidepus just saying on a panel, uh, you agree with the death of the left. But also, that's, that's just making fun. In, in all the rest you said, I, I do agree. And um, um, <coughs> yeah, I think, I think it's, but still I, 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 I struggle with the fact that we now have a panel that um, agrees on the fact that the left is dead, right? Um, but still, I think we also agree in, in what you said that we don't want to do just platypus. I think all of us uh, said that. I mean, you're uh, definitely still another perspective, but, um, and then, okay, the question is, what do we do? Um, we want to do practice. We want to work for socialism um, in a situation where we think the left is dead and what, what um, expressions that had we can discuss, like what, what expressions of the death of the left we face in, the, in our attempts to still work on building a socialist party or something of the kind. Um, the campaign for a socialist party um, in this attempt um, is very, very, let's say, experimental, um, and a very experimental attempt that, that um, I don't know if we really try to build a socialist party, but we at least try to um, explore if there's an interest on the left in society for building a socialist party. And also we try to provoke uh, that interest a bit. Like, let's say, if you, if you want, uh, as a propaganda uh, group that, that tries to, to advertise the idea of building a socialist mass party. Um, and the way um, in which we do that is um, through building up civil society activism. Like, we try to um, also provoke uh, um, dif in different fields of civil society, um, activism that might be, we, we build up a tenants uh, union uh, in Germany, which has uh, uh, about 100 members and organizes more than 1,000 tenants, and none of them is a leftist, like it's just people. Um, we, uh, well, which is, I, I think, <laughs> not, not often the case. Um, we start, start building up a tutoring program for kids in the suburbs, like really what students can do, uh, teach um, like basic mathematics and reading and writing, uh, the alphabet and stuff like this, um, to have them better grades in school, to be able to uh, um, raise in society and work on their working class condition. 
and still we are kind of as the like this is our our civil society project but still we are as the csp we are a group of like-minded let's say socialists um what, what do socialists like like what 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 is like-minded about them what do they share they share the aim of socialism of course um, and in the campaign we share the the opinion or the 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 idea that the way of um the, the, the next step the operational goal as we call it for the aim of socialism is building a socialist party um, as the necessary next step and the tactics or the, the, the strategy to do so to build that party is not like uh, working out a program or um, having like specific political um, opinions on programmatic opinions or ideological opinions on the history of the left or the history of socialism or um, the present uh, society but the, st the strategy is really building up, uh, let's say, social milieu um, uh, through these civil society activism. Like, of course, we won't. We don't think that we will build up really a social milieu, the social milieu which would be the object of the critique of the of the Marxist critique of the Socialist Party. Like, that's a bit of a like megalomanic uh, aim, and I uh, personally don't think like that is really what we're working on at the moment. To be realistic. I think we work on, let's say, models of that or exemplary um, 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 yeah, attempts of that that we could basically learn through, right? I think really we are not at the point of building a party. We are at the point of building on ourselves, educate ourselves on how like the metabolism of society works, like in the, in the, in the microcosms of whatever, a neighborhood, um, a workplace, and, and, and so on. So. Um, what we do, th like the civil society activism really is not socialist at all. It's just basic bourgeois, let's say liberal, it's, it's just liberal activism. We do just, uh, um, yeah, liberal, we, we represent and work on a uh, liberal interest um, social activism. Um, so the question is like, how is the relation to our goal of socialism and, and the uh, uh, campaign for a socialist party that we, um, that, that is kind of the formation that works with it. And the, I, I, I would say the answer is we just don't know, right? We just try to try to find that out. We try to find out if there's any point to socialism um, uh, for this civil activity, and if and, and, and how the like how can so uh, socialism inform our civil activism, and on the un other hand, how can this civil activism inform um, uh, what we think of socialism? Does it have to do? like in the discussion last night with Palestine-Israel, or um, does it have to do with the pe peasants' question in the USSR? Like, we don't, we don't um, uh, encounter that in our civil society activism, definitely we don't. We just, w what we encounter is leftists who are obsessed with questions like this, and um, these questions will stop them from joining our um, civil soci society activism. So we kind of encounter all these programmatic, the, Everything that is that we think of as leftists, we really encounter in practice as obstacles for people to get into uh, any relation with normal people. Um, so, I said like our goal is socialism. Strategy is uh, or, or the next uh, the operational goal. The next step in that goal is the party, the socialist party. The strategy for that is civil society activism, and the um, tactics. For this, for like reaching these, uh, um, this strategy, is totally flexible. Like we don't care at all <laughs> how how we do this. If we go to a neighborhood to to um, tutor kids, then we will we have no idea about how to do it. We will go there. We will ask questions. We will ask other civil society organizations and neighbors and people there what what is necessary. What are the problems? What do they do? Whatever, and then we will find out what are the needs. And how can we, in any way, like organize around these uh, uh, needs that we encounter there? Um, so there's no programmatic way of doing stuff. The only way of doing stuff is, like we say, independent from the state. We want independent action of the working class, whatever. Like we don't encounter them as working class. We encounter them as tenants, as kids, as parents of kids. Like there's, like even the cat cat category of working class doesn't even evolve in our practice, right? It doesn't, it has no role in what we do. Um, and um, 
so 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 basically the 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 tactics and the flexibility of tactics well, if if you wa wanted to have a leftist way of of expressing that is like really the independence of um, our social activism and our political goal of socialism. It's really non-identical, it's totally independent, and it's so independent that even uh, we don't know um, um, what the relation between them is, right? We, we, and, and, and basically the campaign is, uh, as you said, like building cadres. The, the, the campaign is maybe also only a, a little hub to, to get a sense of that relation between civil society activism and socialism. It's maybe only for us to, to learn about the relation of these, if there's a relation, and, and, and then how to act within that relation, right? Um, um, what, what would it mean to, to be a leader in civil society activism, and also what would it mean to propagate socialism in such a context, and the, and the nece necessity for a socialist party. And I think from this um, um, it explains, it is explained uh, already, like our answers to the question, I also agree very much with all of your answers to the question, I think um, like we also consider ourselves pre-political, so what would it mean to take political action? Something very different of what every one of us does today, and uh, even what we do, we, th we consider as pre-political, so um, um, yeah, we try to, to build up the conditions for, for raising up the question, what might political action be? Um, the point of a party is definitely we think that um, we need more than a movement for that or more than just like independently um, uh, organized anarchistic uh, uh, cells or whatever, even though all we do is very anarchistic at the moment, right? We, we try to be, we, we have no differentiation from anarchism, like only that anarchism is much higher and bigger in history than uh, uh, the tiny steps we do. Like we have not, we, 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 tr we would aim to be real anarchists, that would be fine. Um, but still, we think we need a party that, that uh, mediates the civil society um, activism, like as a, let's say, political center or something like that. Um, um, the question where we stand uh, with re respect to this task is zero, minus something, whatever, like we are nowhere in this task. Um, we think we don't even, even though we call ourselves like campaign for a socialist party, we are really in that field, we are only a startup. We have not a business model that works in a market or something. If you, if 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 you want the comparison, but but we're really a startup, like checking what a bit business model could be. Like we are not a startup at all because we don't make money in that end. But, but just a <laughs> comparison. Um, and is Marxism necessary to clarify the task? I'm really not sure. Um, I mean, most of our members think uh, about themselves like as motivated to do this by Marx Marxism. Uh, so do I. I don't know what really the relevance of Marxism for this is, but I, I even consider it maybe like, even, or maybe the campaign is also there for raising the question if Marxism plays any role at all in, in organizing uh, um, civil society or in yeah, reorganizing independent civil society and uh, workers' um, uh, action. Thank you. My turn. Yeah. All right. So mm -hmm. now no, we're supposed to comment on each other, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you. So thanks. Nice to listen to you guys. Um, things we agree upon that I sort of, uh, perhaps not today, but I had agreed upon earlier at least. Um, we also saw ourselves very much inspired by the Second International, what we were doing for some 20 years in Sweden. And like you said yourself, reform or revolution does not affect us today. We also said that. Um, and you were speaking about this broad tent thing, how it prevents you from splits, etc. And you want to get, <coughs> get beyond the sectarianism of the left. And I sympathize with that in many ways also. The problem with this approach, I think, that we sort of realized late in game um, is that how you see upon how you regard these questions take reform or revolution for instance very much affects what you do what you prioritize what's important 
So it's actually your ideas about that, <coughs> our ideas about that, I would say, that should inform what we do, not the other way around. So I don't believe in that anymore, even though I see many healthy signs in sort of wanting to believe in that. I sympathize with the, with the intention, so to speak, again. But there are problems with that approach, I think, that will bite you in the ass sooner or later. <coughs> Thanks. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> yeah uh, thank you all. Um, I found it very interesting. I, some of your remarks uh, brought up questions for me mostly. Um, so one was using, so to say, okay, what does it mean to have like this platypus influence in, in one sense, and then it's a total different approach, what you do with it. Um, so I have a, a question, maybe you also for the, for the whole um, room is interesting. I'd say in also the history of platypus and this notion of the dead left, what does it mean if an organization where the entire leadership is trained in some sense and influenced by platypus is failing in platypus senses in this that it's also part of the dead left? What does it mean for the project? What does it mean for the possibility to go beyond the dead left? If like you have an organization, I like I'd call mine, which is totally influenced on me, where I, I, I always say I learned my Marxism at Platypus. So either I'm just like the wrong kind of person, I'm just doing it wrong, okay, fair. Uh, that's possible, what, what does it mean for the possibilities? Do we just need other people who are better, who are smarter? Or is it that the project is not possible at all? So that was something that raised in my head. Um, and then also I think it's kind of interesting how, um, there's some kind of, yeah, approaches that are similar, some different answers to that, but how this can also um, move forward and influence in a good way. Because for example, um, the campaign for a socialist party, there was a huge influence for my organization in this like civil uh, society organizing and civil activities and I think it's vice versa because uh, two months ago I was at the campaign for a socialist party in Frankfurt and some of them t uh, told me that like this idea of free tuition from students by students was also in some sense um, again uh, influenced or at least uh, inspired by the concrete um, organization we build up in our organization which provides free tuition from students by students online but also in like um, um, yeah, you, some sort of youth center, independent youth centers. And this whole idea developed from the campaign for a socialist party. So it's interesting what to do with this because we see, okay, this is also the influence of Platypus. We have more and more of these organizations and these projects who are trying to achieve something free political to move forward in, in a consciousness of the dead left. Um, but what can we learn from that and go beyond that? Because I, I'd also agree with you that uh, there's some things that probably uh, would, I would say, bite me, uh, bite, bite, your ass. bite your ass. Yeah, that's probably true. I don't know yet where that point will be, but I can uh, very much see that in the future coming. But um, I think then probably the, the right thing to do would be to, to, to ask ourselves, okay, how can we over overcome this next obstacle and become better in that, and become a better organization and do it, do it right the next time, let's say, because I'm also, with this whole approach, I don't have a problem in seeing that my organization will fail in 10 years. I'm okay with that. So if it's, if it's just the next obstacle for the left, yeah, hopefully we'll learn something from it because that I would find the interesting part. So that uh, was also for me very interesting in your interview and what you said that for you and your organization, and your experience, um, you, you'd say, okay, th this, that's not the way. Let's do it another way. Mm -hmm. And we can learn from that now. So how can we do it different? And that's what also would be uh, interesting for me to hear from you what your thoughts are on this. Thank you. Um, I think this is in line with uh, the things that we've noticed uh, from Platypus in general. Um, as I said, it's the first time we interact with this group. We were a bit surprised um, by the, in our eyes, 
it feels a bit, uh, not negative, but pessimistic uh, sometimes. Um, no workers movement is possible, there are no intellectuals, it does more damage than help, and, and, and we should like, um, it completely goes against everything that we try to do. <laughs> <laughs> In the sense that um, I think in our organization, everyone who, is, who joined sees the world and says, the world is fucked. We need to do something. Um, so we grab back at as much political things in, in, as possible and just try out what works and, and try to lead the groups and try to understand them. Uh, and I think we would say that is political work. Um, so maybe that's just a, a bit of a semantic disagreement. I was very happy that the person on my left here, your right, um, um, says uh, some of the things that we also do, like just try to explore ways in which you can build independent workers or peoples, uh, organizations, tenant unions, uh, education kits, uh, that kind of thing, and just try to do it, see what works, instead of uh, trying to first think of the perfect thing out of books from 100 years ago and then probably it still fails because, uh, so as they say sometimes, uh, try many things, uh, so one of them sticks. Um, so I think that is a very brief summary of my response or our, what our response would be. Um, maybe a call to do try something uh, because uh, the world's not getting better if we just say, let's not do anything and let's not do uh, push anyone down. Thank you. So I'm not a disci totally disciplined. Please allow uh, panelists. Please allow me two platypus comments <laughs> to bring home, like one or two platypus points. Not bring home, but a notion. I mean, I think also just just to also to respond to you, like I, I also thought about it a very funny circle. I experienced like early years of the Junge Linke process when people like uh, Jan Schröder, Hanna Schröder, Sebi Fetter influenced very much the young, uh, young, um, the young Greens in Austria, which led to your organization. And then there was also Chris Catrone like coming up with the idea of a, so a campaign for a socialist party several years ago. And uh, through that, in some way, I came to it. And then we learned from your like, like young cadres how to build up the um, tutoring kids tutoring thing. Like really it's a platypus feedback uh, circle maybe, also like sound wise at the moment. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> then, <laughs> the, 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 second, the second point, uh, platypus point I want to make, sorry, <laughs> and then I will definitely talk about the campaign again, is, sorry, but I can't, just can't, it's just undisciplined by me, but I, I will in any way do it. You said, okay, we can, we can maybe, fail better next time or something like this, you, you know? And now we had one task, next obstacle, next task, maybe we fail, but we can reflect on it. And I think it, it might be a problem for a platypus, let's say, <laughs> or, or uh, the existence of platypus is now taking for gr taken for granted by leftists. So they can think, oh, maybe we can learn from, from failures because there's platypus to, to reflect on it. And we have this hub uh, uh, of platypus to reflect on our failures. Like the existence of platypus might already have this kind of influence on leftist, on the on existing leftist, non-leftist uh, organizations. Okay, but now I will advertise my organization, the Campaign for the Socialist Party again. Um, one point I didn't like mention, and I want to agree with you very much, and I thank you for not being uh, <laughs> platypus like uh, uh, um, um, injected already. Um, so um, the, the building up of, a, of, a, of independent um, civil society activism or having like, um, um, the, what I said was the, the important point here for us is the non-identity of um, our political activism and this uh, so-called social activism. Um, in this we of course like the notion in the prompt is the, is the first split in the first international between the anarchists and the Marxists or Marxism like, coming out from the, from the um, critique and vice versa of anarchism and, um, ah, I'm sorry, yeah. The critique of anarchism, okay, I don't have to, to make the big historical line. Um, 
um, the anarchism and the Lasallianism, and, and the question is how can, is, is something like that still possible, but it would only be possible in accepting the non-identity of, the, of, of um, the political and the social struggle, which would mean that in our social struggle we don't um, try to like bend them to any programmatic socialist uh, points, but do it on the, on the ground of their non-identity. Another point I would like to ask also you about your experiences and stuff like this is um, electoral politics. Like if I say we w want to build a socialist party, then what I do not mean at all is having anything to do with um, electoral politics. Like we don't run for any, any offices or something. Huh? I'll come to that. We, uh, uh, we won't run for any, um, for any office or um, letting our like energies being absorbed by uh, uh, campaigning uh, and electoral po politics, but what we think as uh, the role of the campaign is like the mediation of civil society activism, and we don't like jump on uh, uh, liberal civil discontents with our program trying to, to bend them towards socialism or something, but we rather try to um, build up now the socialist or the, the social movement that may play out in 10 years, so that we have like written the campaign in the DNA of the civil discontents in 10 years, but not like jumping on um, um, movements that um, come up now. Uh, okay, now, now Jakob wants to answer also, so I, we couldn't make it happen. Okay, um, I think, Andreas, uh, Aaron, Stanley, and, oh, yeah. Start with Andreas, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much all for your presentations. I'm uh, happy that this panel is, is happening. And I want to start my question with reflecting on yesterday, what we saw. I think it was a very, uh, very interesting day in terms of the, the, the leftist organizations we hosted and the conversations we had. And one thing it got me to reflect upon is the meaning of a sect. Um, because in the afternoon we had uh, Roth with a workshop, um, we had a, another Mike McNair inspired project from Germany, um, and in the evening we had a very uh, intense discussion between uh, the spot assist, the MLPD, and um, uh, uh, historian, and I, I just came to think about like uh, a sect not being identified by a maybe like obscure political position or like a small number of people or an ideologically fixed program, but a sect maybe being you know characterized by the idea of applying a moment from the history of the left to the present, and in this regard. I find it very interesting that there is maybe not such a big difference between, you know, what all of you has have described as a major problem within the left that is like, you know, ideological battles that are completely removed from reality, right? Which all of you try to avoid in that sense, but under which, you know, like by by what means by referring to another historical moment of the history of the left, and that is the Second International, right? So um, I think, you know, in, in that regard, and maybe it goes, this is like a challenge also to what you said, Johannes, ideas matter in that sense. Like, I think all of your um, accesses towards civil social organizing, towards political or pre-political activism, are very much mediated by ideas about the history of the left. Um, so I kind of like, you know, want to get you to reflect on that because the idea of second international Marxism, uh, it's not the first time that it has been brought up. And I'm not talking about like Mike McNair or Baska Sankara like 12 years ago, but also the new left. Um, so I would like to ask all of you, um, why is it that second international Marxism, which is a concrete historical idea you know, or at least a con concrete historical tradition in that sense, is can serve as an inspiration for what you are doing. 
And the second question, just very briefly to all of you, I mean, maybe not all of you agreed that the left is dead, I don't know, but I would be wondering, like, what is the left? And by what criterion, so to speak, can you all say that it's dead? Good questions, Andreas. <coughs> what is the left? Well, it's a project for human emancipation, you could say. A project for human emancipation beyond where we are today. And it's dead because it's not in a, any way in a serious contest for power to bring that about, I would argue. So, and, and that's the thing that I wanted to say when I didn't get the mic now. <laughs> that uh, it's not just a cool slogan. It actually matters for what you do if you take that on board, so to speak. And um, did I say that ideas doesn't matter? If I said so, uh, that was wrong. I, that was not what I meant, at least not what I mean today. I mean, that was sort of how we perhaps thought about it, yeah? The, the, the connection to what was said here about reform or revolution. But my point was that it does matter. <laughs> um, and I think preparatory work needs to be done on different levels today, separated from each other. I don't think you can bring them together. And that's probably where I might differ from you, I guess. Um, I think you're sort of trying to squeeze it together. And I, my experiences, at least, tells that that has a detrimental effect on both levels. Uh, and I think that's uh, to be avoided. Why the second international, you asked, Andreas? And um, well, I think it has been expressed well by other panelists here that it can very much appear as a, a healthy thing compared to what came after. And um, it was also how the working class arose, ar ar arise, how do you fucking say that? Arose. arose, thank you, sorry. Arose to a level where changing the world appeared as a possibility. It, it did indeed, it did indeed. But from where we are today, it's kind of easy to imagine that you would have to work yourself up to a similar level in order to be able to not fail. Yes. Yeah, maybe I just want to bring up um, a question that I had on before because I think it's, it goes well with your question. Uh, because Jim, you said uh, one of the things where no leftists uh, and are in your organization so that you don't organize leftists. And that's also true for, or you try to at least, or no, no leftist question, you have normal people. And that's a, it's a good thing because uh, that's also a goal of my organization. And um, we do kind of well with it, with the no leftist rule, uh, in that sense that we don't want to participate uh, in the same dis discussions. And I think um, that, that the raises then the question, if, if we agree that the left is dead, um, how, how to then be anti-left, uh, how to then be, what does it mean to be anti-left then? And so how can you be in that thing of like, left is dead, but we're still the left, so we're also dead. What are we doing here then? So uh, that, that's for me also this, this question, that, or that's for me something that comes to the second international. So we see that it didn't work. So like, Millions of workers organized, it didn't work. The, like, the, the best parties, the best thinkers, we still have, it didn't work. How are we still sitting here in like this, yeah, really like down point of, of the less left in historical terms and are thinking, okay, we can do better. We can, we can overcome that. Um, it's a question I don't have an answer for. I don't have an answer for that, but it's a bit like Jim said. Um, we are trying to examine if 
at the moment, if, if Marxism is really still that answer, and at the moment, most of us see it as a an, as an, as an helpful tool to gr get a grasp of society and, and, and change. Um, and it's, it's possible that we have to go beyond that. I probably think it's, you're right that this focus on the second international is some kind of sectarianism. It it's definitely is. Um, and and the, the task would be to go beyond that, to go beyond just like, let's do it again, but different. What would that mean? And I, I think that that's the task to find out. And you say, okay, you don't have to, you can't mix these two, so like this trying to do political action and this reflection. Um, I'd say that's kind, that can be true, uh, because I think, I think it's a very interesting history we have with your organization. But to me, it's, it's, it's the same, it's a, it's a bit of a wager. It's, it's not that I could say, yeah, okay, so you tried that, so it's not possible. It's, it, it, I, I think that there is a, this, this room of possibility that me and my organization are trying to find out, is, is there another way? Is there a way to, to connect both of these? And uh, we're failing, but we're constantly trying to do better. It's not enough. Um, but I think the, the most important thing is to be, to have this radical honesty to yourself and to have this like places where you can have this radical honesty and self-reflection. And that's also something um, Jim said, and which is kind of difficult, that um, some parts of the left now think, take Platypus as granted as this room for like self-criticism. And I think uh, probably, um, I also said before that's becoming a problem, our relationship to Platypus, that's becoming too close so that it's, can't serve as this room for self-reflection anymore because um, in my view, we're sometimes not seen enough as part of the dead left as well. We're seen something hopeful or something that you can get your hopes into that uh, probably we have to build something with a similar, um, yeah, with a similar approach for ourselves in our own organization. Um, and that's, that's a huge task, that's a task for years. And I don't yet know how to do that. But that's what I would see maybe as a possibility to connect both of these in, this, in, in, a, in one organization, in one project. Uh, but that's a huge task, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, so first, what is the left and is it dead? Um, I think maybe using the word left to be a sort of all-encompassing term might be the problem why we're constantly talking uh, around the left, um, because I think there are there are things that work and there are things that don't work, and that's a very crude thing to say. Um, but like, social democracy is the left. Uh, Occupy Wall Street was the left, uh, but it didn't work, and there are other things that also don't work. Um, so I think the left as a general mass, which is like discontent with the system and not being a crazy right-wing person um, does still exist and did exist, uh, but wasn't effective. So what we need to do is somehow just try things out that seem logical and might work, see if it works out. And that is also what we, uh, as an organization, because of our history, uh, went back to like the second international of a plurality of opinion, because in we, came into uh, a big conflict and we split off uh, because of this strict, there's only one line within the party allowed and it, you should follow it. Um, so for us, it was very natural to uh, look back and see, oh, it used to not be like this. So why don't you just try it again and see what works? And if it doesn't work out, it, we will see and we'll try something new. Uh, no leftist allowed. Um, I agree with that. <laughs> If you define leftists as people who refuse to re-examine their own uh, position and opinion, um, such as some people who are in sex and still do the same thing as when they started in 1970. Um, and I, th I think combining practice and reflection is something that should be done specifically because in Marxism you can't find out what works if you don't try it. You can't just sit with people in a room and try to think of the perfect system and then put it into action. Because uh, when theory meets reality, you always have some factor you didn't take into account or you misjudged. So that would be our answer to that. Thank you. Okay, so um, 
what is the left? I just want to say, like, our organization, like, the campaign is, of course, a leftist organization, like, on, and our members are leftists, but only the civil society projects um, are, like, like, in the leadership of them are leftists, our members, but also other leftists. But uh, the, the um, membership of these organizations and the people we organize there are non-leftists. Uh, yeah. um, uh, what is the left then, and what, what does it mean that it's deaf, uh, dead? Um, it is like the, the, I think the left, like uh, there are many, many very well-talented, even trained and educated organizers in the left, but they are dead in the sense that they are, all their energy and their capacities are like in vain, spent in vain in any, in, in strange, um, 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 unproductive uh, constellations, organizations, um, context. So the campaign tries to, to um, make them useful again. <laughs> Um, um, yeah, that is that is uh, what the left is. Talented people who also learn stuff, like in specific fields and different fields, and um, but but they have no way of of um, using their capacity, and this is why the campaign um, uh, wants to to approach them and and um, we we want to get you to to join uh, uh, um, the, the project. So the, the then there's the other question of the kind of a histor historicity of the task of building a party. Like we can say, oh, if there's no party, we need one, right? <laughs> like it's true for ev any time in history. In a way, like as long as, as there's capitalism and no party, then we have to build a party. Um, um, so yeah, that, there's a strange a historicity of that. I can't like really resolve that. I can just notion that we are like, last, last night we had uh, three boomers on the panel. Today we are four, mil uh, four millennials on the panel, right? And, w and what is like the, the, the relation of these generations, what, what is my problem, like I was a leftist before Platypus, and I'm a leftist still, a socialist. Um, I, w I, I, I adored the new left and my parents' generation of what they did, how free they were, how organized, how political, whatever, blah, blah. Uh, we had that like um, experience as a model, um, but they failed to give us a party. And we are, as the millennials also failing to give the next generation a party. So this is what, what I can say like about the historicity of this task. Like maybe we are old, old members of the last generation of leftists who think like, okay, let's take the last chance to fucking build the party. Why did our parents not do it? Why did we not do it? Like this is true, and we, but we have to do it, definitely. There's no way around that. Um, yeah, okay, that's... Um, so I, I hope also for you, like, don't uh, get fucked with electoral politics. Like all the attempts fail because people go to go go like go for electoral politics too early, and then they get jobs, and then it's fine. And we still have no party. Um, I will skip this. Yeah. Hello, thank you. Uh, one. Uh, Elephant in the room that I feel that everybody's avoiding is the growth of fascism. And the distress that I feel uh, in you, it seems to me that is because all of the electoral uh, base of, of what is called left social democracy is being gobbled up by the fascist parties. So I wonder why don't you deal with that? And also, you know, like one of the important analysis of Lenin of 1914 disaster that the majority of the Second International joined the war, imperialist war efforts was uh, about, you know, how uh, development of capitalism to imperialism had impacted the uh, working class, and there was a split within the working class. And he analyzed that, you know, it was this, uh, the basis of, uh, you know, why the Second International Majority Parties joined the war efforts was, the class basis was the labor aristocracy. So I wonder that why all of these, you know, realities is not figuring out both current, you know, and the fear that uh, there is a repetition is happening, you know, like uh, Second World War, you know, and First World War, 
and uh, that uh, uh, when you say that the left is dead, it has to do with some of these, you know, metabolisms going on in the society. Uh, so I wonder why this elephant in the room is avoided. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, I'm not at all in on the fascist threat scare. Sorry, but I'm not. I don't buy it for a fucking second. I think it's a psychosis for the left to give it some sense of meaning in its hopeless situation. And I really think that the issue we are suffering from, the elephant in the room, as you said, is that the dead left does not want to realize it's dead. That's really the problem, because <clears throat> that's what prevents us. Um, and it's our weaknesses that are our problems, not strength of our enemy. That's my answer. Um, yeah, the fascism question reminded me of something uh, that was on the panel yesterday, um, because uh, I, I don't know who, but one of them was asked uh, about the uh, actuality of the dictatorship of the proletariat, and he first couldn't understand the answer, and then said, oh yeah, dictatorship of the proletariat. It's a, it's a very recent question, so like it's, uh, it's, it was just in the news or something. Like, um, and I, I'd also say that something that's, that, that's true for like the fight of fascism, it reminds me of something that um, the left goes into without even having the possibility to, if there's fascism on the rise, I mean, we can disagree on that, but even if it's true, what can we do about it? And if we're not in a position to do anything about it, why do we need to discuss if it's true that fascism is on the rise? So if, if, if like our whole project is to get in a situation of power, in a situation of uh, actually um, yeah, acting with society, um, then we need to do that first uh, and, and not talk about whether fascism is on the rise now or yet or not, because there's nothing we can change about it. And I think that's, that's also true for a lot of topics that were raised yesterday. Uh, like the, the whole leftist conflict, Israel-Palestine and all of that. I mean, it's, you, can, you can discuss who's on the wrong side and who's on the right side, but what do you change if you sit here in Berlin and talk about it? Are you in any position to change anything on the history of this conflict at all? And if not, what is the, what is the reason to discuss it? Um, I think the question of fascism is a very interesting one. Um, I think it is relevant to the extent that we have to deal with it uh, one way or the other. Uh, I agree with my colleague on this side uh, that we aren't in a position to fight fascism right now because like our party has 300 uh, active youth members. Uh, we're not gonna defeat Geert Wilders uh, if he decides to go full. Um, so, uh, but it is important to at least understand the causes and understand what might happen if it really goes further than just rhetoric uh, and small uh, uh, politics right now, uh, because it might mean trying to evacuate or having contingency plans uh, if it's really going to escalate. Uh, as for the base, if we can manage somehow to really grow quickly, then it is indeed the case that the base of current uh, strongmen such as uh, AfD and, and, and Trump and builders uh, is also the discontent of the working class that is looking for anything else. I don't think you can equate the people who vote for them to the labor aristocracy because it's just not the same kind of group. Uh, so I think you can try to recapture that base that the social democrats are just letting slip through their fingers to at least soften the impact of the support for fascism. Uh, and I think that is the most immediate task for us right now uh, to do that and to also uh, be aware that fascism can happen and be prepared for that. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with all of my <laughs> colleagues here um, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the fascism question. Um, yeah, we think we can, uh, if there were, was, would be fascism, um, we couldn't do anything about it. Um, uh, but I also disagree that there is at the moment, and I think that is just like um, uh, a, a 
strategy of avoiding to do what would be necessary, that is organize people on the ground of their interests and not organize them against fascism or something. Um, as no one really feels that as a threat in the moment, like in the, in the masses. Um, I rather yes, think like the, the only anti-fascism, if you want so, you can do at the moment, and maybe you, 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 you think you should, is really build up the basis for a, a, a conscious, independent, self-organized working class uh, um, activity, movement, that, um, th that would be like the only weapons that can stop the fascist would be the weapons in the hands of the workers and not um, uh, um, claiming for the state to, to do anything about the uh, right-wing parties or something like this. So um, like our anti-fascism is really our civil society activism. And we even, you could say like, we, we tackle to the right. We speak with right-wingers all the time, like not right-wingers, right but the people we organize in the tenants union, um, the people we encounter uh, uh, in the, in the um, tutoring thing, they are nationalists of any countries, like of any kind, they are uh, racists, whatever, what, uh, uh, you, you name it. They sympathize with the AFD, they might. Some of them are cops, some of them are social democrats, whatever, they are like normal, normal people. All, the, all the, these people leftists would never talk to. Um, uh, this is how like, we tackle really to the, this is where we tackle to the right, and ta tackle to the right, but also tackle the right, and, and meet them uh, on the ground um, of our activity. And um, even the I AFD might be an example of what we failed to do in the last uh, uh, decades, right? They, they built up, um, um, not, not really, I, I mean, they are not an example for us, but um, they, they are um, organized like in, in local communities. They have like their bar pub nights in, in, uh, uh, in small towns and stuff like this. Um, so, and, 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 and when I said like there, there is no party that the new left built, of course, I forgot one, there is one, there's the Green Party, right? And, and just to give you an example, what they did in a specific way is what we want to do. They educated a whole generation for 40 years, about 40 years, around a party. They are now like in all the administrative sections of the state. They are in the schools as teachers, as, um, as politicians. They are in the, in the state administration. They are everywhere, the Greens. Like why do kids now learn about climate change? Because for 40 years, the Greens as a party of the new left built up. They're not a socialist party, of course, and they never were. They maybe weren't left any time, right? But they built a party. Um, ju just to give you an example, like AFD and the Greens, um, there are aspects of them who might be interesting. I thought in the answers there's no time limit, but I'm not a platform <laughs> here. But okay, okay, very. <laughs> There will be many questions. Very quickly, very, very quickly to the, to the, because I want to answer your, your question, uh, about a question, which is the elephant in the room, I think so too. The Second International failed, and we all want to rebuild the Second International. And I don't really have an answer to that, right? I, I really don't. The answer would be like, was Lenin right, or was Rosa Luxemburg right, or, or something like this, or Bernstein? Um, and, 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 and this directly relates to the question like, what? Didn't we have lessons like from the Second International? Why don't we apply them? And I just think they don't apply. Like the, the, the Second International, the, the Third International, then, and their critique of the Second International related to, a, to the critique of a functioning party that was an objective factor in society, right? That they, it, they existed and it was criticized by the revolutionaries, uh, Lenin, Luxembourg, and so on. Um, we don't have that, that object of critique. So we also the lessons, the so-called lessons of that don't apply to our situation. Okay, Erin. Thank you. Um, I want to raise, I think, I guess it's kind of three different historical moments that seem to be raised by this conversation and the questions that have been asked um, in the form of the left which interestingly, the panelists all seem to encounter as both um, an aspiration, like we aspire to be the left, but also as an obstacle. That the existence of the left as it, you know, as it, you all encounter it today, seems to taboo certain practices. Um, there's a similar discussion you all are having, it seems to me, about Marxism. That Marxism today as a guide to action seems to 
taboo certain social and political practices in a way that you find unhelpful. At the same time, there's a desire to be Marxist. Um, uh, because what was the second international besides Marxist? Um, and I think this raises kind of two different historical moments. The left raising the bourgeois revolution, which is the origin of the left, right, in the French Revolution. That's where the term literally comes from. Um, but the idea that there is the necessity of um, clarifying the possibilities for transformation of society and the opportunities to further human freedom, and that the left constitutes that force in society, um, and that this can happen through the open-endedness and freedom of labor. That would have been the idea at the time. Um, and then the second international is kind of the other historical moment that seems to me to be raised as, um, a, I like the way Andreas put it, a sort of anti-sectarian sectarianism, um, a desire to uh, uphold a certain moment in the history of Marxism in order to uh, protect against the way that Marxism in the forums uh, around us today seems to you to be tabooing activity. Um, and so I think I would like to ask you all to consider um, or just answer the question of what was the Second International and why was it Marxist? Um, and the fact that the Second International is Marxist um, raises implicitly already a split politically within the working class, that there would be a Marxist party as opposed to any other party, right, as opposed to a liberal party um, or even as opposed to uh, socialism or anarchism, that there would be a demand for a Marxist party, I think already raises the question of um, the crisis of the politics of the working class. Um, that are inherited from the bourgeois revolution and earlier forms of socialism. Um, so what was the Second International? And then just on the question of fascism, it, it, just because it was raised, um, it reminded me of something I read, I believe in State and Revolution, but it might have been notes to the publicist, I can't remember, um, recently, where Lenin's talking about fascism and he's talking about the Italian Communist Party. And he says that fascism will be a wonderful opportunity for the working class and for um, the struggle for socialism, the prol for proletarian socialism, to learn that the demand um, put forward by the Marxist Second International, by social democracy, the demand to constitute and organize the proletariat as a class, organizes not only the revolution but the counter-revolution and necessitates a split in the working class, that the crisis of capitalism um, actually reappears in the working class and that fascism um, is an expression of that. Um, so I just wanted to raise that because I think that the specter of fascism that's raised by the left does have a historical content, actually. I think that there is a question of um, the split in the working class movement. What is proletarian consciousness and why is it um, that Marxism existed at all? Why did it seem necessary to be Marxist as opposed to anything else? Thank you. Someone wants to answer? There was a ton of questions there, and I can't answer all of them, um, but I can give an attempt, a few. Um, my point isn't really that Marxism is taboo for certain practice. I don't, I don't really know how you formulate it, but I don't really recognize my own thought in it. Uh, but what I think is it's, it's not possible as a political practice. That's my point. Uh, and that's why I speak for this preparatory work, because conditions need to be explored if they can, conditions to make things possible. So it's, it's an explore, explorational task in a sense. Um, you asked what the Second International was, and it was an organized force of masses of workers in the developed countries of capitalism in the belly of the beast, so to speak. And um, it was an international force. And it was Marxist because it had working class seizure of power as its horizon, which uh, I think is uh, crucial for something to count as Marxist. It's sort of the ingredient in the soup. Um, Yep. Then I don't remember the rest of the questions. When 
remember what he wants to answer, we can... Answer oh. Huh? Uh, like, answer, but... Ah, uh, it's... Uh, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm also not sure if I really got the questions, but I try to um, answer the way in which... Um, I think you were asking in which way was the um, second international in Marxist and how we kind of relate to that. And I, I sh for sure, have no sophisticated answer in this, but I still try to, to make sense of this. In the way that I think that something we think we have learned, let's say, from Marxism, is that um, we do not identify the social and the political action, or let them reduce each other to one another, right? We, we try to really hold up the non-identity of them which is maybe or was in the second for the second inter international the non identity of social and political action we of course don't encounter anything like that um, um, that, that would compare to to um, this the the way in which marx um, and the second international encounters that uh, contradiction of political and uh, social action but w let's say this is very informative for us to to be the reflection of the non identity and the contradiction maybe of them uh, or, or to let this contradiction evolve instead of um, just being either political or social, which normally means like that in your activism with the workers or tenants or kids, you try to be socialist, right? People try to have a socialist tenants union instead of the liberal bourgeois tenants community uh, thing or something like this. We, we try just to very strictly, maybe dogmatically, separate them and, and holding up the non-identity. Maybe this is something that I would uh, consider as Marxism within the Second International, or how, how, it, how it is Marxism and not uh, just socialism or something. Um, and of course, I don't know if this was a question or if this was just taken for granted that we encounter Marxism and the left as an obstacle to what we want to do. We definitely do. like Because all the people we can talk to um, for building a socialist party are leftists. And they all consider themselves Marxists. Like everyone who reacts to our calls, uh, to our um, uh, um, proposal for what to do and stuff, all of uh, everyone who reacts is a leftist, and they come with ideas from the left that are definitely ob obstacles. Right? They they won't won't want w want to work with cops uh, in in the tenants union. They don't want to um, whatever. They have uh, right right ev every couleur of the left has their own like obstacles that stop them for, uh, from the practice. I, is, it, is it like feminist, the gendering thing? Is it anti-vokism that stops them from like uh, talking normal to people? Um, is it um, uh, uh, whatever, anti-fascism? I, I don't want to talk to Ukrainian nationalists or pro-Putin, Russian, whatever, uh, defenders. I don't want to talk to anti-Semites, racists, whatever, right? Like every color of the left has a, is a very obvious obstacle to all we want to do, and we have to work through that. We, we have to attack it and say, let, let go from that. Just just talk to the people. Like we encounter it very much as an obstacle too. And the way in which maybe Marxism might inform us, I, I try to say, but I also have to say, it, it, I, I would yeah. There's no way in which we can really compare our the way. Political, the political and the social is non-identical in our activity. Has uh, like is not comparable to how it uh, was non-identical uh, for Marx in the Second International. Part B. Long list. Yeah, yeah you will really want to. One more quick uh, answer, because uh, because I also find it difficult to answer the questions. But also, I, I won't think of it as a Marxism as a taboo, but in some sense as an obstacle for the clarity uh, on the task what what needs to be done. And, and this really uh, came to my mind uh, at yesterday's panel, because I, I, I w sometimes I was sitting there and I was asking, okay, in like 20, 30 years, people are watching this and. What are they saying? Like, what are they doing there? Like, there's a bunch of people sitting on a Saturday, uh, on a Friday afternoon in Berlin, and listening to people who talk about who was wrong in 1920 and what wh what your organization was wrong there, and you was there, and Trotsky was so mean back then. You're so mean now again. And <laughs> what is it? What the, what are we doing here? And in in that sense, I think that's something maybe true for for all of us. Marxism is an obstacle because that's in the name of Marxism. That's all. This whole discussion we have is in the name of Marxism, 
because it's it's like the, the reality that Marxism created till to now, it's it's failure created. Um, so I think in that sense it's an obstacle, and that's also why it's important to to distance yourself from that while still thinking that Marxism may also be an answer, but we don't know. Um, and to keep uh, um, asking a question on to the question, what was the second international? I also cannot give a, a sophisticated answer on that, but I, I can give one to why it's important for us, but why it's interesting. I think it's, it's, it's like this task to create an object of critique where um, you're not just, you actually, you have an object of critique like the working class, organized working class, and a party of the working class. And that's something we aspire to, to have again. So that's, that's one point. Because it also had an idea to, the Second International had an idea of how to change society to further freedom in concrete ways, not just like in, in the ideas, but in a concrete way. Um, and, it, and it took, in that sense, the, the unresolved questions of the past and gave it a new kind of answer, I'd say. And that's very different to today because, in a sense, um, we're just a mutation of the, que of the answers to that unresolved questions. So we are just, if, if the Second International gave the question of freedom in society a new answer after the failure of the bourgeois revolutions, um, we are just a, mut a mutation of, of this failed answer, of this failed new answer. The task would be, and that's why the Second International is this object of uh, interest, I'd say, to create this new platform, this new object that is uh, able to give new answers and not just mutations of the old one. And I think uh, the panel yesterday also showed that again, that it's just mutations. Still one to add? Thank you. Um, I mean, one way of considering Marxism that's kind of traditional is as a theory of history. And there hasn't really been any consideration of history on the panel. Um, I think the only person who really put forward any kind of historical perspective was the um, comrade from the Netherlands who said that we live in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, and that that somehow, though he didn't elaborate it, informs his political perspective. And I don't think any of the speakers really put forward a kind of concrete political perspective um, that was sort of historically informed. The discussion of the Second International seems very ahistorical. Um, I, I want to maybe be raise something of the obstacle that you all seem to want to avoid. Um, there's Lenin there on the board behind you, um, and there's this term Marxist mass party, um, which, especially coming from the UK, reminds me of a, another Lenin term that's kind of related in version, bourgeois workers party. Um, and the other thing, the title, Building a Mass pa pa Marxist Party Anew, reminds me of is Trotsky's 1933, uh, To Build Communist Parties and an International Anew. And part of the perspective that came out of that beginning of Trotskyism was that the crisis was one of revolutionary leadership and that there were mass, uh, let's say, bourgeois workers' parties um, that needed new leadership, and also that new organizations could be formed to which the workers would flood when there would be at some point in the future an upturn, right? Trotsky in 1933 is saying we're in an ebb right now, we're in a decay, we're in a sort of low point, uh, but we need to prepare for this upturn. And slightly later, part of what came out of that was what later became entryism, which is the idea that you have to go through the bourgeois workers' parties and you can't just say, oh, that's the dead left, we want to avoid it, we don't really want to deal with them. Um, but actually you have to raise a political perspective in those parties. Now, it might be that your historical perspective is that there's been a discontinuity in those parties such that they no longer are bourgeois workers' parties or that that term doesn't even mean anything. But I would like to get the comrade from the Netherlands to kind of speak to this because I think you actually 
had a perspective of basically a typical kind of trying to work within an existing organization. Uh, I don't know if you're part of or relate to the communist platform or you're not part. Okay, so maybe you could speak about your differences with the communist platform in the Netherlands and how you relate differently to the SP now from what they do and whether working through the existing organizations is necessary. Because one alternative to the kind of civil, social, pre-political work that a lot of you are proposing, or one problem with that might be that every time you go out and try to do that, you're still going to encounter the legacy of the dead left in layers of activists which are spontaneously produced despite you, and that without having a political perspective towards that, you're never actually going to find this magic place where it's just normal people that you can organize. Um, so I'd like to hear about that, but especially from the, the comrade from the Netherlands. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, I am not part and have never been part of the communist platform. The communist platform is the covert faction that originated in the Socialist Party to try to uh, steer the Socialist Party towards a more Marxist uh, direction. Uh, so I think that there is maybe a semantic, but at least a small difference between entryism and what we did, even though the end result was still a split and a, a new party, uh, in that we weren't, or, or we, I say, I was closely affiliated with communist platform, like I knew all the people, most of the people in them, I agree with 80, 90 percent of the politics, but I never became a member because of differences in opinion on specific organizational things. Uh, I will get into later. Um, but this group, the communist platform, and the, the clique around it, like the, their fellow travelers, they really originated in the Socialist Party. I joined the Socialist Party. I was a Marxist, uh, but I never considered joining uh, the, the, the new communist parties in the Netherlands because I find very sectarian place where you have to follow very strict ideological guidelines. Uh, so I joined the Socialist Party and I really just, as a fresh member, as a, especially as a young person, thought, oh, I can do something here. And then, especially within the youth, a realization started to occur like, this isn't going anywhere and everything that we propose is getting shut down. And I think that is the origin of that uh, split within this specific organization. Uh, I think that it's applicable. We see the same thing happening now with uh, the Green Party in the Netherlands, uh, where a similar development of like a sort of internal party polarization is happening. Some parts are moving more radical and some parts are clinging more to the liberal uh, green politics. Uh, and it might uh, result in a similar conflict. Um, and I think that about covers our speech. So we maybe we seem to be realigned with the SP. I'm uh, reminding us that SP is a faction who have a political outlook on like challenging their politics because they have a base in the working class or not. Or yeah, that was it. Uh, the communist platform uh, initially <laughs> followed that exact line. They said uh, the Socialist Party is the most advanced uh, and, and impactful. Uh, political organization that has connections with the working class. Um, since the split, some people still hold that, but as, as time goes on, and the Socialist Party is further and further declining, uh, both in influence, in membership, and in the electoral result, uh, that is slowly fading away as a, like a major or a, even a, 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 a valuable opinion. Uh, so I think maybe one and a half years ago, about a year or a half year after the split, there were still many people in communist platform itself that would say we should try to get back into the communist platform, but many of the fellow travelers, including me, um, like half a year before the split, we said it's not going to work. We should just try to, we're probably going to get kicked out. We just have to try to get as many people with us as possible and try to get something new. Uh, so I personally never said we should go back to the Socialist Party because yeah, they're, they're not just, just gonna change their mind the leadership uh, after purging all of the youth and many local chapters uh, on allowing the the wreckers back in. Yeah. Oh, so you want to? Yeah. Well. Yeah. Very short.
that magic place, Ephraim. It does exist. It's called a working class. There are no leftists there. I can testify as such. <laughs> and what I said in my presentation, that preparatory work in the working class in no way necessitates Marxist education, is true, in my opinion, in principle. It does, however, not mean that Marxist education is of no use for people doing that. I claim it is. Uh, it informs decisions you make, which path one treads, and which battle one chooses to engage in. So I think there is a good use for that. I say it, it's not a necessity, because that would be dishonest to claim. But that magic place exists. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a perfect segue, thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna direct the first part of the question to Johanna specifically, sorry. Um, I'd quite like you to talk about uh, in more detail what's next for the socialist Erna, which you have talked about in other places and you've talked about to me, um, but you've made reference to that, that there will be a, uh, there's a separation between your sort of practical organizational work and a kind of intellectual work. And I'd quite like you to flesh that out just so you can get responses from the other panelists on that uh, and to see where your disagreements might lie at a kind of tactical level, um, which you've already alluded to is differences in tactics are often also kind of ideological, intellectual disagreements and, and um, rely on different interpretations of history. And related to that, I'd like to ask, because uh, I think this is relevant to everyone, what's the meaning of uh, working class independence? Because uh, I think especially Jim and Johannes have talked about independence, but primarily in terms of independence from the state. So civil society organizing independent from the state. Whereas I think there is another conception of working class independence, which is political. Right, and where does where does that come in? That uh, it's working class independence from capitalist politics, uh, and I suspect that the agreement may be that that's just not on the table. Thanks. So I'll try to be brief because I could also be very unbrief on this, uh, <laughs> and I don't know to begin with w how this will. Uh, if this will be the path taken by my organization. That's an open question still. Um, but I think about, like I said, two levels of uh, activity kept separate. One is uh, building structures of independence in the working class. I'm, I only really know well workplace organizing, but what Jim is speaking about in tenants and similar is also, I mean, I'm not against that. Um, I think I think one difference there is that Jim explicitly says you know that the two Please take the mic. Of the bricks that are being chosen. <laughs> Sorry, well, I think one difference is that Jim has explicitly said that they aren't really going to the workers. They aren't going to the magic place. Mm. Um, you know, those kids who are being tutored aren't necessarily working class. Well, sure. But my, my point is that I'm not saying that workplaces are sort of the only arena for this. There might be others also. I just don't know them, so I can't speak for them. Um, so you're talking about working class independence in relation to the state, indeed. But it's also independence from sort of existing trade unions, in a sense. Um, so it's about building muscle, I would use as an analogy, in the working class. M muscle to do something which in Swedish context is non-existent today. I mean, Swedish union, unions don't even know how to strike, you could say. So not even the most modest liberal bourgeois horizons of working class activity is today present in, in Swedish context. So it's, that's the scene for that. I don't know if it, I mean, I could go into much more detail about how to do this, but that's a different panel, I think. Um, okay, the detail is that people must be adults, not children. Because the way things work today, people are kept in sort of child status. They don't know things, 
they don't get to decide things. That's sort of the core of the tactics to be used, in my opinion, that people have to be treated as adults, because that's the only way they can learn, if they get to know and if they get to decide. So they own the consequences of their own actions taken, decisions made. That's the only way you can ever develop. Because if you don't know, I mean, what can you do? And if you don't do, how can you think about what you've done? Is it still in terms of decisions, or in terms of being able to think about it? It's in terms of building capacity to even think about striking, I would say. To do anything, really. And the other side, then, is, I mean, I feel a great sort of indebtedness. Do you say that? Indebtedness? No? I mean, debt. Yeah. Yeah, to what you guys are doing. Um, and I appreciate your efforts very much. Uh, when I first <coughs> heard about Platypus, I didn't know. I thought it was some obscure philosopher, because we don't call the animal Platypus a Platypus in Swedish. It's a different name for it. So I thought it was some, <laughs> some obscure guy. <laughs> and this, 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 this other half, <laughs> this other half could in many ways be similar to platypus, but also I think I'm a different species of animal. <laughs> and I have a different habitat <laughs> than the platypuses reside in. More of a lion. I don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that. Uh, so it would be different because of that. But it would also have many connections, I think. But it would be ideological work. Preparing ideas, working with ideas, education about ideas for those interested, both from the working class and from other places. Because there is always a minority in the working class. If you do what I'm speaking about, like in workplace organization, what you, what you do is that you work with people who don't give a fuck about Marxism. Yeah? But you will also have people who are interested in that. They will be a small minority, but they will be there. And you, you will have the tinfoil hats and you know, the right-wingers and everyone, and they're all interested in radical ideas. Yeah? And there is no home for them. There is no place for working with ideas in a productive way. So that would sort of be what I think the objectives are. And so I also like about you your approach of being a combat organization, sort of dissolving ideological obstacles, etc. And I. I agree on that task also. Was it any answer to your question? Yes, there's a different question. You asked for everyone to answer, right? Yes. A bit like not about uh, your, your plans, but just in reaction to that, I totally agree, like couldn't agree more with what you was, were saying about being adults and not being adults. Like really, this if you call it magic place or not, like the people we encounter, they are not adults. They, 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 they cannot organize, they cannot knock the door of their neighbors. And I mean leftists as well as the normal people. Like they are de-educated, de-alphabetized really. They can't write a letter for their own concern to the institution they have to deal with for their life. They cannot read the letters they get from them, from the state, from a business, from like uh, law, anything, whatever, they can't read it, they can't answer to it, they can't relate it. They are really, the, the society is very, very disorganized. In being, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, but, but you were both talking about that, that um, point. Um, in being very organized, of course, like the capitalist state has them totally organized, but not independently, but as, as consumers, as people who buy stuff, of people who open their mouths and get shit ideology in, and get some money out of them, or at least don't uh, be too expensive for the state or something like this, right? They are really treated like animals and they aren't adults. What we have to do is not encounter them as a working class and working class consciousness, but really um, um, establish um, context in which they can, are treated as adults, can act as adults, can experience themselves as adults, as, as being responsible for their own concerns in very tiny, very tiny context, like really that I cannot emphasize more. Um, um, and, and that is the question of independence that you said at the moment, really that, uh, in, the, in terms of politics, uh, political independence from bourgeois politics, 
yeah, that is, that is that we aren't at that at that point, but that's definitely the aim of a social of a, of a socialist party that we want to build, like being a socialist party independent of bourgeois capitalist politics. And of course, all the parties that exist at the present are capitalist parties, right? I, I, I think I don't have to say this, but also the left party, also whatever, they are the capitalist politics, and they are the politics, they are the party that made the people like non-adult, childish, uh, I I unresponsible for their own life people. All these parties are responsible for the, if it's in the education system, if it's in how they, how they administrate the people in their, as citizens, if it's in, in their jobs, is, if it's in wherever, in their entertainment, they are deactivated, they are passive, like a passive mass of people. That is what the state and all the parties, including the left party, does to the people to make them non-adults. That's the problem that we face on a like microscopic uh, level to just just encounter that de-alphabetization really of the, of the of the masses, and we encounter it on the, on the in the roots of society, like really like like as you said, kids, and they are they are workers like sociology so, uh, sociological. They are all the all the people we work with are workers sociological. Like just just I don't know if we if you got it right. And what I just mean, we're like we don't approach them as workers, like in their capacity as conscious working class or fighting working class. We, 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 we encounter them at the moment as tenants, as parents of kids, workers' kids, workers' tenants. But like, like and, and that's, of course, another question about this, where's the zero magic point, right? Um, where the, there are normal people. There are these points, and we try to find them, uh, like in, in, the, in the kids and the parents, like they are really not... Uh, in some ideological, um, involved in any ideological systems, uh, uh, like they aren't in parties or something. But if you, if you encounter, the, like, like the next elephant in the room is of course the unions. Like where do we encounter workers? Not, lo not like with some kids and their parents and some, some tenants, but really what, what we need to aim for are the workers and the organized working class. And it's very organized in Germany, for example, yeah, right? It's one of the most organized fighting, effective uh, um, working class in the world, which means one of the most, or the most administered working class in the world. Like we have, like we are, we, we cannot imagine how impossible it is to step in there as socialists. What people do is in 17 years, 70 years or something, right? But they are, they are like the, the, the best um, 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 bulwarks, how do you call it? Like <laughs> the best uh, 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 militarized, organizations against socialist interventions, right? They have a 100 year history of m being more militarily um, 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 protected from socialists than the army, for example, right? The army is much easier to, to, to uh, intervene in than, than, the, than the unions in Germany, no way. And this is just, just to see the distance from where we have to go and where we are. We are really less, less, less than zero. That's a very interesting point. Uh, I think the most interesting from the panel, for us at least, uh, because I see very many parallels with how we operate. Um, perhaps you've given, uh, been given the impression that we are a very broad and vague uh, group ideologically, but I think this is one of the reasons why we attract, not we specifically don't try to recruit only university students. Most of the members, uh, at least in my chapter, haven't been to university, including myself, haven't been politically active in schools. Um, and what we do, we recruit people through like XR demonstrations in which people are told to go there, go there, do that, and listen to uh, the, the people who have the leadership. Uh, and the same with normal protests. And we get them in, and it's a very easy, low level, chill out uh, kind of organization when you get in, you can just if you want to like help out, you can just help out and slowly but surely we try to give them a little bit of a task like, oh, can you help organize like a banner painting evening, like put out these announcements and then we help them out and slowly but surely we have to teach each, each other, especially with the youth uh, who don't get taught any kind of leadership or organizational skills, these kinds of skills that make uh, working class independence in the end eventually possible. The same things we see with our adult wing, which is try to organize for tenants. There are very little of them who know or have like the, the self-confidence to 
go through uh, streets, knock on doors, like he said, or to uh, write a letter, or to speak their mind even at a meeting. Um, and it really has, we have, and I think that is the task that we need to do as socialists, is first with our own cadre, everyone who wants to get in, get them in, don't throw a hundred books at them, uh, just slowly but surely teach them up from the ground up to be uh, organizationally in, independent and have confidence in themselves. And then once you have some people to actually do something, do that with a tenant union or some sort of student occupation or whatever your specific circumstance as a person is. Uh, and that was, uh, I'm very happy with this, uh, this discussion. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Uh, on, on the question of independence, because I agree with this analogy, but I don't agree with the analogy of children, because children have the possibility to care for themselves in some way, and capitalist society today withholds people from the possibility to care for themselves. So that's, I, I'd say, the analogy doesn't fit, because that's, that's really the problem we also encountered, that this... this also this feeling of people that uh, the society doesn't give them the tools or the possibility to care for themselves anymore. They're just like they're at the will of like politics, they're at the will of the ruling parties. And that's also, I think, a reason for a lot of discontent in society, this feeling of unfreedom. And it's also what I'd say is, is our task that we give po uh, people, not, not even working class, but like people, the possibility to, to be able to care for themselves, to uh, articulate their own interests, and to not only articulate, but just like bring them to the society, to give them back some sort of, or give back, give them individual freedom some, of some sort in a society that uh, is full of unfreedom. I can see the time motion. Nah, come on, John. Uh, um, <laughs> It's of course not only them who are not adults, it's more, most of all, ourselves. Like we go in the field and we have no idea what tenants, how, how, how do we lower the rent? How do we uh, uh, act with the um, landlords or whomever? We're also children, yeah. Yeah, um, I guess I, in some sense, want to come back to um, Ephraim's question about history and maybe put it a little bit more archly. Um, I mean, I guess I might begin by you know, saying in, in Platypus, we have a conceit, which I think is really very tricky, that through, or, or we believe that through our activity, we can begin to experience history, right? That somehow, in some negative sense, through you know, however improbably hosting a conversation on the left, we can experience history. Uh, and I want to raise this question of, can you experience history through your activity? Right, because the issue of, I think the, even the question of, you know, why do we need a party? needs to be thematized a little bit more, right? Like the, we don't need a party to, the, to be the, you know, the general staff of the revolution, right, to order it to happen, right? Um, no party ever made a revolution, right, that way. Uh, we need the party in order, in some sense, to experience our activity as historical, right? Uh, to, for historical consciousness, right? This question. And that's a very different notion of historical consciousness than, you know, a, a, a bourgeois sort of uh, labor metaphysical conception of theory and practice. Right, that like you fail because you, you, you're trying to build a house and you fail because it, the roof leaks and you know how to build a house better. Right, it's not that. Right, it's, and it's not history conceived in those terms, right, as like the growing dominance of labor. Right, um, 
in, in that sense, it's not a bourgeois conception of, of historical experience, exactly. Um, so I'm, when we say things like, we live after 1989, or leftists refuse to reflect because they think it's still 1970, right? I mean, I guess I would ask, first of all, you know, what's 1970? But what does it mean to reflect? All right? Like, obviously, 1970s come after the 60s and before the 80s, but that's not what we mean historically, right? Maybe the 70s are regressive in relation to the 60s or something else. Maybe they're a repetition, right? Uh, so I think that, I, I think even to a degree, there's a crisis within platypus around this issue, right? Of you know, what does it mean to experience our moment now after the wave of the millennial left, right? In this period of seeming, you know, after the crisis, um, what, is it, what does it mean to experience history and how does that come up through the types of activities that you're talking about? Oh. I don't want to, I don't want to answer, so, but, but I think I have to. <laughs> um. I mean, there's some sense in which I think, as, a, as I said, like I, I can just answer personally, um, not as the campaign, also not, not as platypus. Um, so I fail the question in a way, um, um, which, which is, of course, something I experienced, or, or that is a relation of me being here the whole time. Like, do I have to avoid your qu quest platypus questions or hide from them or uh, uh, defend against them or like having a smart move out of them or something like this, dodge them. Um, and maybe here's the point where I failed, let's say, if, if you want to see it like this. Um, I can, in a way, I'm, but I'm asking also myself, like what did I, how did I encounter history through platypus, right? And, and this is definitely one of the most important o or only ways in which I did. Um, and there was some historical experience I expressed before, which was like my let's say, naive, early um, uh, encountering of the left or being part of the left in trying to repeat the new left, really, really. I heard the music of them. I, um, I, I was in the, in the uh, Trotskyist uh, sects, and then I tried to be a hippie, too, and stuff like this. Um, so uh, this was a historical experience, and, I, and, I, and, and, and there was something like in, in a sense in which that was an obstacle. And then Platypus was, of course, a very much historical uh, experience of, of, of maybe something like history, but only in this very negative sense in which I recognize the failure uh, or, 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 or the way in which history is really an obstacle and not a means. Like all the Marxists are always like having like history as a means for what they do. And may it be legitimation, justification of what they do, but they think of history as a means, and I, what I think, like to sum it up very shortly, <laughs> I, I learned history as, a, as an obstacle to, to the left and their tactics and what they want to do, and action and doing socialism, working for it. Um, and I think that also informs the campaign in the way that we try to dodge it then, right? Like we try to um, then not make historical claims, and this is now what you're bringing up. I'm just like, in a way, repeating your question <laughs> in other terms, like saying, okay, now you're saying, okay, you're dodging history, so isn't history coming back, or where is it then? I don't know, that's where I fail. <laughs> so, I, I noticed that there's a lot of emphasis on the possibility of state capture. If you try to make a party in a context where society is inadequately organized, the party will tend to become capitalist. It will tend to, in some way, be captured by the capitalist state. But there's also the reverse problem, I think, which is that if you try to organize society in a context where there is no image of what politics could be, because the Soviet Union is gone, there's you know, a sense of no alternative, you know, that historical point, 
has foreclosed the, the sense of political possibility. So if you organize civil society in a situation where people don't see any political possibility, then you might improve their capacities, but those won't be politically realized. They'll tend to be developed in some other way. You know, instead of creating a master who can be an adult, you create someone who goes, well, there's nothing for me to do as an adult, so I'll become a, a manager. I'll become uh, someone who goes into finance. The critique of people outside of platypus is often that platypus produces finance people. <laughs> you know, so what if what you know the, the issue then is that the civil society activity of the platypus, uh, you know, makes the the meerkat, you know, the the market. It makes someone who is going well. I can't do anything political, so I have to just go into the market. My life will be a market life because there's nothing else to do. <laughs> the question is, is there also a problem with trying to do society organizing outside of a political project? You know, that without the political idea that is, is compelling in some way, you know, the fact that any time you bring up Marxism, the worker goes, ugh, what's that? You can't do anything with that. Soviet Union, blah, right? The fact that that's what happens means that when you organize civil society, it doesn't seem like that, uh, you know, gets you a, a result. So the question is, does this matter for the civil society organizing? Do you think about it when you do civil society organizing? Is there something you can do about that problem? Good question. Um, short answer, I think. Uh, I think it's very important. Uh, at least, uh, well, as you said, you can't just go to workers anymore and say, oh, look at the Soviet Union. Wasn't that cool? Everyone will say, but it's dead. And it is dead. It, def it failed. So you can't just easily use it as a rallying cry or an example for people to aspire to. So I think what most people do when we are on the ground, like trying to convince people, um, and I think you can see examples like uh, in with, with all speakers online on YouTube, they go to people and like, oh, doesn't your boss suck? Wouldn't it be better if like you and your colleagues like elected your own boss? And those are like very tiny sets that in themselves don't make a Marxist society description as a whole. Um, but those are ways in which you can start to, um, how do you say that, like uh, try to uh, invite people to start to think about new possible ways of organizing a society. Uh, and eventually those things must come together uh, into a more coherent whole uh, as soon as you grow as a party. But to begin to convince people, you need to like pinpoint the specific problems that they have within a, mostly in a class background because most of the problems we, we try to tackle are class-based. And you can easily say, hey, this problem sucks. In the problem itself, you can find its negation to use some complicated terms. So that would be my answer. Um, also, Related to the to the question before again uh, with history, it's, it's I mean they are related, right? Because it's about the the images of history. How 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 do they play out? Are they a means or are they um, an obstacle? And I mean so a, a version of the uto of the aim and utopia of Platypus, like or what is Platypus for? Is to free the minds of the present from the images of the past, right? That are boundaries or or limitations to, to our imagination. And I, I mean, of course, it's very, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it wouldn't be true to say that is what we do in the campaign. But let's say there is, um, the question might be informed by, okay, Platypus has done that, like for me it is in, informed as a Platypus member, like not for the campaign. And basically, it's all, of course, it's also not how Platypus thinks about Platypus, and it's not how the campaign thinks about Platypus or the campaign. But um, a way I would think about it is like, it, it, for me, it's, a, it's an attempt of like tipping into the question, has Platypus in the, no, not 10 years, like 17 years or whatever, like um, uh, trained, uh, worked through historical obstacles and trained enough cadres to be free to now, uh, without like these limiting images from history, um, 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 make politics, like at, uh, make the attempt again. And of course, probably it's not, it's a few hundred people that we educated, maybe it's a few thousand if you uh, make it more, but um, like definitely not cadres in the way 
maybe uh, in, in any way, um, but um, let's say this, you could relate this question to this, and, and it's the way I personally think about it, like, we, like, like a task for platypus could be to, to resolve those obstacles to without these obstacles and wrong images that are obstacles, then attempt uh, um, uh, as a free generation uh, the task again. Ben's question. <coughs> I think Jim said a lot of s smart things here. I agree about, but also there is a problem, of course, and you're pointing to, I agree. But there can also be the case that tools to really solve that aren't present at hand, but could eventually appear on the journey, hopefully. Yeah, but just I uh, can, can answer that. I don't know if I got the, 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 the question right, or I, I even got the statement right, but I found it quite interesting. But what I can say um, is that there's a problem with this non-political perspective that in some sense, is if, we, if your project is pre-political and it's not showing towards something, what you actually do is telling people, oh, that's all just kind of some exercise and it's training to get to understand what needs to be done really, what really needs to be done. And the problem is, it, if you're in that mindset, you're not doing it right. So on the one hand, you have to say, okay, we're not, not like the other leftists, I, I probably agree um, that we all say, okay, we're not organizing for the revolution tomorrow because it's there tomorrow and the workers are waiting for us and this and that. But what is it then what we do? Because we're d making a means to an end. We make saying, okay, we're organizing for a possibility of really organizing people for something. But if you're doing that in that mindset, you're not really organizing people for something. It's, it becomes a circle. And that's, it's a hard question I don't know the answer to, but it's something that really uh, occurs to me in my organization, just on like very su subjective factors, because it's not really interesting for someone to join an organization which is saying like, oh yeah, join us because you're doing years of unpaid exercise for the possibility of that some change might be possible. We don't know what kind of change. We, so th it's not really interesting to join some kind of organization that is really doing like this. And it's a, it's a theoretical problem. But it's also a very practical problem. Um, yes. But, but to, to comment on that, just very, really quick. I know you want to break this off. <laughs> <coughs> but that's not really a problem in sort of the workplace arena. Because there is motivation for people to do things because it affects them. And you were opening with that reform and revolution, so that might be a good way to close it. Because even though you pursue whatever, shorter work hours or higher pay or whatever, for a different reason than those you are pursuing that with, doesn't really matter so much, in my opinion. So there is always this potential to do this, in my experience. And I think that's what needs to be taken seriously. Yeah, to see, yeah, I think that's the, the, that's the task that's, that's, that's there, to have something that can serve both means, so that you, have the, you can ch get a possibility of something, and it just really is, yeah, something better for people. That's something they want, so to say, something that's also, if it's not just an exercise, it's, it's nicer to have that. It's, it's, a better, it's a better thing. You do it to build power. Yeah. They might embark on that to get higher pay. Yeah. yeah. And, but I think that it's also a necessity to get projects out of the workplace there because we have unions, we have the problem with uh, building power there. So like Jim said, this project, so how can you build power in different parts of civil society? Mm, that next panel. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm sorry, we, ha we only have time for one last question uh, and I would ask you to um, use it to make an end to the panel. Um, so many people on the list, and <laughs> I really don't know. Danny. <laughs> yeah, I'll try to be quick about this. Um, it, it seems that there was a, a question about how to judge uh, what we're doing in our practical activity. I'm speaking from the standpoint of the speakers. 
And my first question was simply, could we just judge what you're doing on the basis of liberalism? Um, that tends to be like a first question that comes to mind. Now, I know if I was to bring this up in certain circumstances, maybe to the tenants union in Philadelphia, they would say, ah, comrade, combat liberalism. I mean, even as soon as that question is raised, then there's some kind of part of the history of the left that seems to intervene on why, no, we couldn't recognize ourselves as being liberal activists, there's something different. And I, I feel like, you know, going back to maybe Spencer and Ephraim's question, that that's related to the party, meaning that it allowed people to recognize, yes, what we're doing, maybe everything that we're doing is liberal, and that maybe only in the final instance would it have anything that pointed beyond that horizon. So I guess I would just raise, you know, this question, is it fine and, and fair to just maybe judge everything at the standpoint of liberalism? I Meaning, um, Jim, you brought up all sorts of parties that are very effective at the level of civil society. And even if Marxism was wrong, you would still want a robust civil society. I would hope, I would be the kind of world I would want to live in. Um, so just those two questions. I'm really not. Muted me. <laughs> In the so called practical field, if we call it that. Yeah, I think, yes. Yeah, because I had different motivations. I don't do that because I want to pursue these things in themselves. They are means to an end, they aren't the end. And I think that makes a lot of difference, but not just if you look at that, what, what is happening here, what, what is the, the character of what's going on, then you could definitely frame it like you do. I don't think you will. I think, I think so too. I'm, I, I don't know if I really got the question, but what we do really, or what we would aim for, would aim for because, w as I said, like the task is too, <laughs> too big that to really um, uh, feed the illusion in you as if we would be doing that. But what we would like to do is, or, or, or what would be like the, the trajectory of, of what we do is reconstitution of, of, of like liberal civil society and uh, uh, bourgeois subjects uh, acting in their own interests or something like this. With like in the background knowing there is a boundary to it within capitalism, right? So, and, and that these boundaries might make political action that is the party necessary. But we want to try like, to, to find out about this necessity of the party or, or of political socialist action, uh, not through only or whatever. We, we, we know about this, if we know about this necessity, we know about it from reading Marx and Lenin and all the, all the other uh, boys. And <laughs> um, uh, but but we, we, we try to make an attempt of finding out practically about that necessity. Like where do, do we encounter any, any in, in uh, liberal activism, any point in which th that points to that necessity of, of socialism, of political action, of um, um, the, the uh, socialist party. Like, um, and, and definitely there's no point. I mean, there are some examples in which we encounter the state already, like um, um, policies or laws that are obstacles to our tiny steps, baby, baby steps. Um, um, and then we encounter the state a bit, right? But, um, and that would ask for political action or raise the question of political action. Um, yet it's not at all action beyond the spectrum, like the, the, the like liberal uh, uh, politics then. Um, yeah, but this is definitely the question we try to find out about in, in practice, right? Like, like, like Marx thought about Marxism or his theory, let's say, right? as a means to facilitate um, the, the, uh, the practice, the, the uh, social activity and activism of the working class um, to enlighten what they do. Um, and it's not at all that at the moment, right? Um, <coughs> and the question is like, do we need to reconstitute this kind of liberal activism of the, of the working class um, to go to the same uh, boundaries or similar boundaries of capitalism to, in practice, 
um, asked about the necessity of a of socialism as 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 a different politics from liberalism in practice. What do you mean? What do you mean exactly on the basis of on the basis in judging it on the basis of liberalism? What can you explain shortly? Explain what you exactly mean with that? Like in other words, maybe every I mean, I, I think somebody else also mentioned reform or revolution earlier. I I forget. I apologize. I think Jacob, you might have mentioned it. In other words, the whole debate that shows up at the turn of the century is that what really differentiates Marxism from liberalism? And like the whole thing with Luxembourg is it's only the final goal. Otherwise, maybe every single thing one is doing is liberal activism. And that's where it seems to reach this kind of point, but it, it feels kind of odd for us to, to do so. At least that's my, my opinion today, where like, oh, I'm gonna say, no, this is a Marxist tenant organizing um, group or a Marxist bowling club. Um, I understand the question now. Uh, I think that there, uh, so the, not the goal, but like the, act, the concrete activity that, is, for example, bowling club is a very simple example. Bowling club is, in its essence, uh, an, an apolitical concept. Um, but I think the difference between like a socialist version and a non-socialist version of that would be um, both the people in it and also a sort of background type, or whatever you want to call it, a background political idea, which is much less strong in like real social uh, events and, and, and organization, but in a tenant union, um, just having some influence from an ideology in that, especially in uh, a tenant union, which is explicitly a class conflict between landlords and people who have to rent, um, that does impact the way that they work. Uh, so I think you can differentiate um, charity work and organizational work based on if it has the political aspect. I think social organizations are more meant to, so for bowling clubs are more meant to just give the working class a space to be the working class with each other uh, instead of having to join a paid-for club that is dominated or run by some kind of business owner. I agree with the comments of the Netherlands that there's, on the practical level, there's, you can differentiate in like the methods, but I think it's also true that it's just, yeah, in some sort, liberalism. Because I think we all agreed on this like um, analogy of children and, and uh, just like becoming adults, and, and that's just basically the point, right? To, to give people the possibility of caring for themselves, expressing themselves, expressing their interests, and also changing it, society in their interests. And it's just maybe also then the task for now to, uh, yeah, save liberalism from the liberals. It's <laughs> kind of strange, but yeah, in some sense, maybe, maybe it is. Yeah. I already, I was the first answer. I said yes. Well, so we're done now. <laughs> <laughs>